So when I was two years old, I was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer called a neurosarcoma. Um, sarcomas are very unpredictable, they're a very aggressive type of cancer and unfortunately chemotherapy doesn't work on it and they haven't found a cure. So usually with sarcomas the treatment is either drastic surgery or death. Obviously my parents didn't want to take the option of death so um, they chose to have my leg amputated to save my life. Um, before I had my leg amputated though I went through a year of chemotherapy. Apparently I was diagnosed with a small bump behind my right knee and my mum thought that it was a spider bite and went to get it checked out and then found out that it was actually cancer. Um, and there, there, was a, there were a few errors in the way that they removed the tumour in terms of they didn't know which direction that it was growing in. So, you know, there were a few key areas where I guess a few mistakes were made and I always question if those mistakes were fixed, if I would still have two legs or not. But to be honest, I don't really care if, I'll have, if I have two legs because I wouldn't be where I am today if I did. Fortunately, my parents made the decision to um, enrol me into swimming lessons to aid my rehabilitation back into a normal lifestyle and that's how I got into swimming. So it's kind of something great that's come from a tragedy which I think is pretty cool. To be honest when I was growing up with one leg I didn't really notice that I was different from any other kids. Um, my parents told me that I was just a normal kid and I had a twin sister who treated me exactly the same. You know she took me under her arm at school and I guess showed me the ropes of how to do everything properly. Um, and I learned to adapt to everything, you know, I, I still played on the monkey bars, I still went down slides and everything. I did everything a normal kid did. Um, and I didn't notice that, you know, some kids were staring and, you know, some kids were pointing me out to their friends and saying, what's wrong with that girl over there? Um, so growing up with one leg was a normal lifestyle for me. You know, I had obviously the odd problems every now and then. Um, my leg fell off once at school and it snapped in half once and that got me out of an assignment, which was cool. Um, I misplaced my leg at school once, which you think is hard to do, but for a five-year-old it's quite easy to do. And then my teacher had to go and find it for me. So uh, I was sitting um, on the oval and I had one of my friends ask me, oh, how, do you, how does your leg come off, you know, how do you wear it? And he was very interested about the mechanics of it. So I took it off and um, I ended up going to play on the playground for a little bit. And then when I came back, it wasn't there anymore. And I was thinking, who would hide a prosthetic leg? Like, that's low. And I had to get my sister to, you know, take me back to my classroom and my teacher's gone, Ellie, where's your leg gone? And I'm going, I don't know, miss. You're going to have to find it for me. <laughs> you know, like when you're sick at school and you, you, your teacher sends you to go and see the nurse? Whenever my leg broke at school, I had to go and see the school mechanic. He was like... <laughs> but apart from that, you know, I just had a normal childhood. I guess my semi-serious swimming career started when I was about 10 or 11. You know, I wasn't yet in high school, but I'd finished my Learn to Swim um, program at King's. I'd graduated and my mum asked me what I wanted to do with my life, which is a silly question to ask a 10 year old. And she asked me if I wanted to do squad swimming. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll go give it a try. And I went to um, Frankston High School swimming pool and I jumped in and my coach, Russell Parsons, was a Melbourne Demons supporter and I was a Melbourne Demons supporter. Go the D's. And um, he treated anyone that supported the D's, you know, like they were a queen or a king. So I got treated really well in my first training session just because of that small factor that my coach went for the Demons. And I think that's where my swimming career started, was from that, which I think is amazing. But, you know, I kept going back and back and back and um, I never really thought that I wanted to be a Paralympian. Like I'd seen it on the TV before and obviously I wanted to go but it was never a big goal of mine and you know I was just improving every time I swam. You know I always tried to fix something being a perfectionist and eventually my technique you know was close to perfect and you know my fitness levels were going up and you know I was climbing the rankings in Australia and all of a sudden I was at the top before I knew it which was pretty amazing. You know, when I was in year nine, I was only 14 years of age and I went to the World Championships trials um, at the end of the year in 2006 in South Africa in Durban and um, it was a very exciting time for me. You know, I was only 14 and I was in a team full of, you know, 20 year olds. So I was around people that were much more mature than me and I got to experience a completely different side of life. You know, I was a kid that was training with 10 to 12 year olds, you know, at a pool in Frankston that was 25 metres. Um, and overheated because it was used for learn to swim primarily. You know, from going from a, an atmosphere like that to a world championships atmosphere within a week is, you know, quite overwhelming. 
and I went over there and won a silver medal which was very exciting and that's kind of when Swimming Australia thought that I could have some potential and really started putting some work into me but when I came home you know I'd been on such a high for so long that I came home and I didn't know what to do with myself um, I didn't you know, know where to put all my energy into because I was having a break from swimming and that's when you know things started turning really bad you know I stopped turning up to school I started talking back to my teachers um, I stopped turning up to training my mum thought that I was on drugs which I wasn't but she thought I was because I was you know acting so I guess irrationally and you know I was pretty much uncontrollable for a good two years of my life there. You know the transition from primary school to high school really wasn't that different to what I was used to. I knew that someone was going to have a go at me for having one leg, I just knew it was bound to happen eventually and it actually happened on the first day. Um, a kid called Zach came up to me and said, oh pirate what are you doing, hey what are you doing? And I'm like, that's not that offensive, but that's not on. <laughs> and I took my leg off and I threw it at him like a javelin, thinking that, you know, being in drama class, it would have been socially acceptable to do something like that. It's quite a dramatic way to deal with something. And um, everyone just, you know, mouths open, shocked that I'd done that. And I think a kind of a wave of um, fear went through the class that, oh my goodness, I better not mess with that girl. She will throw her leg at me. <laughs> so. Um, you know, obviously I don't condone violence, but there was that only, there's only been one time when I've used my prosthetic leg as a weapon. You know, when I was 12 years old, I thought I had a very normal lifestyle. Um, I thought that, you know, having protein shakes after training, um, having ice baths and physio and massage and everything like that was a normal lifestyle for a 12 year old. And it wasn't until I moved to the Australian Institute of Sport when I was 19 or 18 and I started talking to other athletes about you know what they did when they were young younger athletes and younger kids and you know they didn't start taking all their proteins and recovery methods and everything until they were about 17 or 18 so um, I think from a very young age my parents were setting me up to be an elite athlete and I didn't even realize it at the time until I was 18 that that was happening. I was at the Beijing Paralympic trials all of a sudden I was really nervous there because I wasn't prepared like I should have been and you know that's when you get the most nervous is when you know you haven't done the work, that's why I usually get nervous anyway. Um, I still managed to make the team somehow for the Beijing Paralympic Games and I was the youngest swimmer on the team and I went to the Games a couple of months later after a lot of training, you know I really buckled down after that and really applied myself. Um, went to the games, it was very overwhelming. I have this one memory um, of Beijing. It was right before I won my silver medal, which was my very first um, medal that I'd won at the games. And I was sitting in the call room and I was really nervous, obviously. Um, and I have a really unstable knee. And if I have any material gather behind my knee, it will usually dislocate. And back then, you know, we wore the this racing bathers that went all the way down to the ankles. And I, I put you know, my, my leg up on the chair and all this material gathered behind my knee and dislocated my knee right before I was going to walk out for my race. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I've just dislocated my knee and I'm about to swim 100 metres butterfly. That's not a good thing at all. But um, I actually found it very interesting that when you are competing at an event like that, you have so much adrenaline running through you that you don't feel anything anyway, so it didn't affect me. It's not the knee that dislocates, sorry, it's the kneecap. You know, when you walk out into the um, competition area, you have to walk through the warm-up area to get there. And I watched the TV as I was walking through it, and I saw Matt Cowdery had just won his, his race. And I was thinking, oh wow, Matt's just won his race, that's really exciting. You know, I'm very proud of him, go, go Australia. And then I'm thinking, uh oh, if Matt Cowdery's just won his race, it means that my race is up next. And I'm thinking, this isn't good, I'm not even in the core room. And you're meant to be in the core room half an hour before your race starts, so I'm thinking, I'm stuffed. So I quickly ran or hopped or whatever, I was, I was on crutches. I crutched my way <laughs> to the call room. And right when I walked in, I burst through the doors and I was saying, you know, Ellie call for Australia, I'm here for my race, it's up next, it's up next. And right when I walked in, I saw, you know, the last summer of my race walking out onto the pool deck. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I've just, you know, missed my race. And the, the lady was um, on a little microphone and she said, I'll, I'll be with you in a second. And she went off and spoke to someone through a headset and said that you can't go on because it will look bad on TV. 
And I just, you know, obviously wasn't very happy with that. So I got to go to bed quite early that night. I was obviously upset, but it gave me enough energy to compete for the rest of the week and, you know, win two more medals. So.